my topic, my assigned topic is preparing hives for winter. I'd love to add a clever Game of Thrones analogy here, but I don't get HBO, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so here we go. Um, a little bit about me. I was inspired to learn about beekeeping back in 2015 after I read The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd. Um, I loved the book um, better than the movie. Um, and then, I don't know why this isn't working very well. Okay, so I went online and I, of course, um, started to Google quite a bit and look for different resources on uh, beekeeping. And I found a nice little association called the Bristol County Beekeepers Association. And um, I looked at the calendar and it looked like they were having a meeting pretty soon. Uh, it just so happened to be May. Uh, yeah, so it was the May meeting and anyone who's familiar with our club knows that the very last meeting of the season is held on the fourth Tuesday of the month. So that was the day after Memorial Day that year. Um, I just kind of jumped into it. I, um, we held, it was held in the library of Bristol uh, Aggie School. And um, there are just a, a bunch of nice people sitting around in the library. And um, there just ha so happened to be a couple of, um, couple of guys being, you know, a little bit boisterous at the table next to me. And I, I one voice rose above the rest. And um, I introduced myself to Mr. Wayne Andrews. Uh, so he, he, I told him that I lived in Dighton. Um, he asked me how many hives I had, and I told him that I didn't have any, and he said, why not? And I said, well, I haven't been to B-School yet, and he said, well, I teach B-School, and I also live down the street, and you need a hive. So three days later, here's where we are. Um, he made a few phone calls. I had a hive by that Friday. I had never read a book about beekeeping. I had looked at online at a couple of videos. That was about it. I do not recommend beginning in this manner, but it's because um, we had a dedicated mentor like Wayne popping in to check on us every couple of days that I believe that we were so successful. Um, so whether you have a full-fledged mentor, a bee school appointed bee buddy, or just a bunch of friends that you like to talk bees with, it's really beneficial um, to, to just really talk and, and talk with other beekeepers and um, learn from everybody's experiences and just, you know, share some ideas and things that you, you'd like to try. So that's me and Wayne. Um, you'll see my, this is my squeaky clean uh, bee jacket. You'll never ever see me in anything that clean again. And um, I swear that Wayne let me install the nuke wearing flip-flops knowing that six years later, I'd be embarrassing myself in front of my B club. The fact that I've got flip-flops on and um, leather gloves, quite <laughs> like the pairing actually. So, let me, okay, so. Um, my, our overwintering success to date, we have not technically lost any hives over winter um, since that first hive that we started with in 2015. Um, we never expect all of our hives to make it through. I've heard to plan on about 20 to 25 percent losses, uh, which means we usually go through the winter with a few nukes. Nukes are handy if you lose hives over winter because you're able to quickly replace that colony. Uh, if you don't lose any colonies over the winter, you'll need to find homes for all of your nukes and splits if you don't plan on growing your apiary. Uh, we've gifted quite a few and even sold some in the past. Uh, another thing is if you're gonna overwinter, you have to plan on 
having some additional equipment on hand for spring splits. So you're gonna you're gonna want either cardboard nukes um, to split into uh, if you're gonna sell them, or or just additional woodenware. You're gonna need some undrawn frames, things like that, just to um, put it on your Christmas list so that you have everything in the fall. I mean, in the in the spring. Uh, also, you'll see that we ramped up over the first four years. Um, live and learn. We learned that three locations was way too much for us and everything that we had going on in our lives. Uh, we decided to bring it back down to two locations from three and we also learned how many hives were ideal at each location. Uh, we've got three at our home and two off-site at the moment. Our nukes are at the house as well. Okay, so why is overwintering so very important? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna hit you with a, with a buzzword, sustainability. You have the opportunity to, to maintain a sustainable apiary every single year. Um, this starts with the first year beekeeper all the way up to, you know, seasoned person. Um, everybody's got that opportunity. Um, and, Oh, I want to talk about imported bees. So the state of Massachusetts imports over 14,000 nukes and packages each year. And with each nuke and package that comes into your apiary from anywhere, uh, there's a potential to bring in pests and disease into your apiary. MDAR tries to inspect every imported nuke uh, that comes from out of state uh, weather and scheduling are factors that would prevent this. Last year, they were unable to inspect one batch because it was snowing. Um, these, most of these imported bees come from Georgia, Louisiana, Connecticut, some, um, and from as far away as California. Uh, oh, and you'll see right here, there's a little MDAR sticker just happens to be on um, Ori's box here. But um, when you see one of these MDAR stickers, this little yellow guy right here, um, you'll, you'll know that your nuke has been inspected. Uh, another benefit to overwintering is being able to catch that spring honey flow. Spring honey flows are the best and overwintered hives are really, really primed and ready to catch it. Um, these little guys are really rare to go in the spring. Um, they're expanding quickly. Uh, we've got four supers on this one. We catch a majority of our honey um, in our apiary during May and June. This year we averaged about 130 pounds per hive for the full year, but we did get the majority from our spring flow, um, especially with the drought that everyone experienced. Um, and, you know, try doing that with a package. <laughs> Beekeepers that successfully overwinter can quickly grow their own apiaries and can also share their stock with local beekeeping community through gifts or sales. Um, quite literally, your overwinter hives can pay for all of your bee expenses for the following year. Um, between the honey that you catch and the nukes that you build, the splits, if you can, you, you know, you can, you can make a lot of money in the spring um, if you're looking to pay for your beekeeping habit. Keys to overwintering success. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I'm not sure what just happened. Okay, uh, where we got? We got queen right colonies with healthy populations. Um, this is what one of the things that you're gonna need in order to overwinter a hive. Now, remember most queens will slow down uh, the beginning of the fall, end of summer, or when resources are diminished. Um, and that includes a drought 
be absolutely sure that your queen is missing before you take drastic actions. In late fall, it's, it's pretty difficult to tell if your, if your hive is actually queenless. Um, you'll see oh, all of a sudden there'll be no, no, um, no eggs. Um, and sometimes the queen will shrink down a little bit more. And also sometimes in the fall, and this happens to us every now and then, there could have been a supersedure over the past, you know, month or two, and you are looking for a marked queen and your queen doesn't have a mark on it. <laughs> so just because you can't find her the first time around um, doesn't mean she's not actually there. So it's very important. Um, we don't want to waste our money or resources on, um, yeah, by buying a new, buying a new queen when you don't actually, you're not, you're not needing it. Um, a way to tell if you've got a healthy population is if when you go to inspect your hive, um, you take that inner cover off and the seams in between the frames, uh, the bees are just going to kind of come up and kind of check you out, just kind of bubble up a little bit. Um, and um, so if, if all your seams have bees or most of them have bees, you're, you've got a healthy population um, uh, that I've got a slide coming up and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, also, if you find a weak colony uh, or two weak colonies even, consider combining them it's better to have one overwintered colony than two over uh, two colonies that just don't make it. Um, and I know everyone gets really attached to our queens. Some people name them, some people put signs on their hives with the queen's names. Just a couple people that I know <laughs> do that. <laughs> but anyway. Amy, if, Amy, are you referring to me? I, I, I may be. I just wanted to make sure you were listening, Nikki. They're adorable, but you know what? If if Queen Latifah isn't doing her job, um, sometimes you gotta just maybe there'll be a Queen Latifah too someday. <laughs> I'll um, keep that in mind. <laughs> so uh, determining population. Um, so we talked about the seams. Okay, so this is an acceptable amount of bees in a hive that would overwinter, you would expect uh, fairly well. We don't want to see too much less than this. And over on the right, we, this is a hive that was just really booming. Um, we actually got four splits out of this hive in the spring and um, really around this time of year, this is the only way to determine the population size now that it's colder because you don't wanna attempt to remove frames at this point unless temp uh, temperatures are you know above 60 degrees, it's sunny, it's calm. You really don't wanna go too far into your beehive at this point. Um, so this is a really good way to determine what your population is, what you, to, to know what you're dealing with. All right. Um, one of the most important things on our list is to make sure that our mites are under control. Your goal for the year should be to go into fall with a low count or no Varroa. Um, it's really key. We've learned over the past few years that Varroa feed on the fat bodies of bees, and this is Dr. Sam Ramsey on the left. He made an amazing presentation for us um, at Bristol County at, at um, BCC a few years ago when he had just um, really made this kind of discovery, and it was really wonderful and new for the beekeeping community to get this new information. Um, we talk about wanting fat bees to overwinter for us. So literally these bees that don't, are that, that aren't bothered by varroa mites are literally fatter than the ones that aren't, um, that, um, excuse me, that are. So we really literally want to have um, as, as low a varroa count as possible going into the fall, 
going into, uh, especially around now, um, and testing for mites throughout the season, it's key. Uh, population can get way out of control in a matter of weeks because when the queens slow down and there is more, there's less, um, there's less brood for the mites to go down and kind of hang out and um, there, there's less cat brood, the mites will actually come out and ride along on the bees. Um, this is when you'll see more, your, your numbers will go up because there's less brood for the varroa to hide away in. Also, if, and, and this is especially true for large hives with really large brood nests, and when they shrink down, you're really going to see the numbers go up if you, if you in fact do have varroa mites, um, a problem in, in that particular hive. Also, a large hive tends to be stronger and um, will most likely be one of the culprits when, when you see um, robbing in a certain area. It's a, it's a really strong hive that will rob another hive out and they will go into weaker hives. And oftentimes the reason that the weaker hive is weak is because of varroa mites. And of course, we'll get these hitchhikers um, hopping on to our strong hive and migrating over. We want to tree throughout the summer and fall. If our mite count goes above that threshold of three to nine varroa mites per 300 bees, uh, if you keep them in check over the summer and fall, um, I'm not saying you won't have any because you probably will still have some, but your numbers will be a lot easier to deal with at that point and your bees will be more healthy. It's very important to match conditions with treatments. Uh, temperatures, weather, brood exists, and if your honey supers are on, are all major factors in product choice. It's very, very, very important to follow treatment instructions. Your bees are depending on it. We, also, we always have to remember that when we treat for mites, we are literally attempting to kill a bug on a bug. These are pesticides, insecticides. We are putting them into our hives. So we have to remember that we need to, you know, ventilate properly, um, make sure the temperatures are exactly what they need to be. Um, and if it, if you, you want to test before and know what your mite level is and then test afterwards to make sure that your treatment did in fact work. So this is a graph that is showing um, that in 2019, the MDAR apiary inspectors saw a total of 74 dead out hives in a dozen counties in Mass. The yellow line on this graph represents the treatment threshold of three to nine mites per 300 bees. In all but one example, there were extremely high levels of mites present in the samples of dead bees that were gathered. This doesn't prove that every hive was killed by mites, but I would say without a doubt that the Varroa might at least play a part in the death of these colonies. We as beekeepers can help avoid this by being vigilant, especially in late fall and early summer, testing every couple of weeks, treating appropriately when the mite levels reach that threshold level. And you can really save your colony. It's, it really is in your hands. It's very important also to have treatments on hand and be ready to be applied as soon as you determine that you need to treat. It can sometimes take weeks to obtain certain treatments. I know that some of y'all must have had have been in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts at one point, so you, you want to be prepared. I also wanted to show you a frame from a dead out. Uh, this might count, the might count from this high was very, very high. You'll notice in this image that there is literally capped honey one cell over from some of these dead bees. Um, a lot of people will see, you know, I think that the phrase is butts out. If, if you see, um, it, it looks like, it appears that these bees were looking for food and that's why they died in this manner. But obviously they had, they had, enough, um, they had enough food to survive, 
I'm not saying for the entire winter, but there, there was enough for them to continue on um, past this point. But um, there were definitely mites involved in this one. And this is uh, an alcohol wash kit. Um, MDAR jars, mite wash jars are available for free. The brochure is online on their website. Um, you get that little quarter cup, cheap at the dollar store. Um, and of course, there's the rubbing alcohol that you want to use with that wash kit. Um, I know with the pandemic, people have been asking if there are any kind of alternatives to alcohol um, and what people have been using is, with some success is cold weather windshield washer fluid. It has a higher alcohol content for whatever reason. Um, there's also folks that have had success with uh, salt water. I don't know what the recipe is as far as um, how to, what, what the salinity needs to be. Um, probably could find that online. And um, another alternative would be blue Dawn dish liquid and water, but uh, good luck finding the mites through those suds. I'm not sure how long it would take for those to, to dissipate, but um, those are acceptable alternatives to using alcohol. And we always want to go into the fall with heavy hives. Uh, so 70 to 90 pounds of honey is required really to get um, a too deep 10 frame hive through the winter. Uh, we run our double nukes around 45 pounds or so. We, um, one of the options to feed is if you want to feed back the honey from, you know, when you take your supers off, obviously, you, you know, you can, you can save a bucket for the bees if you'd like. Um, also, there, we do oftentimes run across a situation where we've got, cap, we've got capped honey frames, we've got uncapped honey frames. Um, what we do in our apiary is um, we will actually put our partially capped and uncapped frames from our supers into our extractor and just do like a really, a really light extraction from them. Um, we'll just, we'll run it through, you know, not, not full speed. Um, and it'll take all of that wet honey out of those frames and we will just fill a bucket um, if that's, you know, we, we take however much we get and we will feed that back to the bees once um, we take all the supers off. And um, it's really a great, you know, it's, it's the best nutrition that they can get. I mean, it's, it's not you know, cane sugar, it's not beet sugar, it's, it's really what they need. Um, the, other, the other option is to feed two to one, two parts sugar, one part water. Um, and you should always allow one week to dry after a feeding cycle. So you really don't want to feed liquid when you see that the temperatures are going to be really low that next week. Um, it's one thing that the bees can't handle. Um, they can handle the cold, but the, the, what they can't, the, what they really can't handle is the moisture. So you really want to let them have a, a bit of time to dry that two to one out. And I wanted to talk also about, um, Fondant and candy, and this this is considered emergency feeding. Um, if your hives go in with seventy to ninety pounds, um, you shouldn't have to be putting candy on. You know, it. Bef I would say before the new year, um, when you feel like your hives are getting lighter, and I'll show you in a in a little bit how to weigh those hives just with your hands. Um, you you would apply fondant and candy if you feel like your hives are very light. 
this particular hive was, um, it had a very high population and um, this, this year, I'm not saying, I'm not sure which year it was, but I, I do remember that they were not um, really in cluster much before this. So they were just going through a lot more honey than we expected them to. So you would feed solid when it's um, cold below 50. Um, it's a it's an emergency food, and um, also I wouldn't recommend or we we don't feed pollen after September. If it's needed, we'd far, start uh, feeding pollen in March, like when the skunk cabbage comes in, because you don't really want to encourage brood reading, rearing too early. You can get fondant at bakery supply stores, um, or you can do it yourself. Um, there's a recipe or two floating, floating around out there. Um, it's, it's pretty much just sugar. Um, some people put a pinch of salt and, you know, just probably like a, a few drops of water and, and you can make kind of like, cake, like, like patties of sugar and you can, um, apply it, you know, directly onto the frames. I believe that we actually had to smoke a bit to get them out of the way. Um, and you'll see our wintering inner outer. Excuse me. You don't want to, you don't want to put it over the inner cover. You want to put it right on the frames. Um, and you'll see that down, down in this area, um, you can see our winter cover and it's, insulated and I'll show you a picture of a different one later but you'll see that we do have kind of like a, a built-in candy board um, in this particular one so it, it gives a, uh, an inch or two a bit of room so that you can put candy on the hive if you need to emergent, uh, feed them you know in an emergency situation okay other important items to consider Ventilation. Um, here you'll see, this is a picture of one of our upper entrances. We've got a little hole right here. Um, you need, need, need to have ventilation in an upper entrance. Um, that's, if, if people ask, if this is actually a, a small candy board. Um, even if you're using your, your inner cover, your, um, your, the hole, the knot should be down to allow them some, some ventilation uh, for the warm air and the, the warm moist air to get out in the winter. Um, also, you might consider uh, creating a windbreak if your hive is exposed from, um, for, from north winds. Um, you can put up a fence. Um, some people put some hay around their hives. Um, there are a lot of different methods to consider. One of the things that we do for wind um, is sometimes we'll wrap our hives in tar paper. Uh, we prefer this to something like a, a Be Cozy or a bubble foil just because um, we like the fact that when there's a sunny day, the sun will actually warm up that hive with that black tar paper. Uh, we find that the bee cozies will act kind of like a kind of like a cooler. <laughs> it's it's insulating from the weather outside, but um, then it, it takes you know it, it takes away from the sun's ability to get through that insulation and actually warm up the colony a little bit. Um, and the tar paper helps with the wind as well. Uh, and here's a picture of our insulated winter covers. Um, one of the styles that we use. Um, so you'll see that there's a little bit um, of a candy board here. And we've got our home, and, and this is, um, insulation that we cut, uh, we just got it at Home Depot. We like to use the foil wrapped, um, mostly because 
if you're just using that pink insulation, we find that ants really love to get up in there and kind of chew that up a bit. Um, this right here, hopefully you guys can see my cursor. Um, this right here is a home assault board and you can buy those at bee supply stores or you could buy that at like a Home Depot and cut it to size and we put it in between our inner cover and our insulated cover and that really acts um, to absorb some of the moisture that hits the top before it comes out of that inner cover hole or the candy shim hole. Um, another thing that we like to do is we, we like to have additional extra homo soap boards hanging around because you know sometimes you go into that hive and the homo soap's really doing a great job and it's wet and sometimes there might even be a little bit of mold on there what we do is we have dry clean ones available and so what we'll do is swap them out on a nice day and put you know, the, the wet, soggy ones in the sun, um, it helps to clear up a little of that. Sometimes we get a little bit of um, moldiness to it. You can spray that down if you'd like. And um, it helps to, to keep the hive nice and dry. Mouse guards. Uh, you don't want to find this. <laughs> You don't want to find this in your hive. We've got a little buddy here. I think that's a little cockroach behind him, some kind of little bug. But um, you, you absolutely want to use mouse guards, um, especially if you've got fields around your house. Uh, most of us do. Uh, we're we're living in the we're living in the country, and um, they will they will make just a real mess. Um, even if your hive is strong you can still get a mouse in there. And I'm not saying that they won't kill the mouse, but the mouse is gonna make a nasty mess before you ever find out that they have actually killed it. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite terrible to have to deal with. Um, also make 100% sure that there's not already a mouse in your hive before you put that in, um, you, you put your mouse guard on. So. Um, there's our little friend and uh, something else that you should be making sure you do is um, we don't use the screen bottom boards but uh, we 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 I just want to mention that that's something that you would normally want to do is um, put your inserts in your bottom board for winterization Another thing is we don't want our hives to get tipped over. Um, we want to be able to make sure that um, they're weatherproof. We, we use these little straps. I don't even think they're not called ratchet straps. They're called tie down. I'm not sure what they're called, but I think you all know what I mean. <laughs> That's the picture of it. We use these on, um, on all of our hives. We've got cinder blocks underneath. So we plant the cinder blocks. We put the um the hives on the cinder blocks and then we feed these straps right through the cinder blocks um we've had success with weights as well um and not just for the weather but um this is something that we caught in, on our in a realer street location in north dighton um we found that we had a pest and we weren't sure exactly what it was and as you'll see we've got these wrapped in tar paper. Um, we went there a couple times and the tar paper have been, has been just ripped right off of it. Uh, we have these little mouse guards uh, that, that screw right onto our entrance reducers and the mouse guards have actually been pulled back and bent their metal. Um, we had no idea what it could be and it turned out to be a Fisher cat. Um, another thing to note is that we never saw any dead bees out in front of, of these hives. They were just absolutely clean. We figured, you know, it might be something small coming along and, and taking care of that, but um, it was something big coming along and taking care of that. So I thought that you all would be interested um, in our winter visitor. Winter activities. 
something that we should all do is provide a sunny water source. When the bees are active, they need water. Um, this, I believe, was taken in, I want to say like February. We didn't have any snow um, at that point, but especially because we didn't have any snow, the bees really did need the water. Um, oftentimes they'll find it in the driveway or whatever on, on, a, on a fairly warm day um, snow melt, but um, it's a really, really great idea just to keep them uh, well watered. They do need it. They do need water to dilute the honey to feed the larva. Um, and so that's what we do. Uh, remove the snow and the ice and the dead bees from the bottom board. Um, we keep a little, <laughs> a, a, a stick handy. Uh, we always, you know, throw our veil on and just kind of sweep the bottom of the hives just to make sure that um, there's enough ventilation down there. You know, you, a certain amount of bees, bee deaths is normal. I mean, the bees are gonna die. Um, just it's it's they've got a lifespan and um, not all of them are going to make it all the way through the winter so there's not always a good opportunity weather wise for the the other bees to you know practice their good hygiene and remove the bees from the hive so you want to you want to help them a little bit um, dead bees out in front of a hive in the winter is actually a good thing. So you, you'll, it's, it is a natural thing. Um, you see poop outside the hive. It doesn't mean that they are having no Um, you'll see little yellow dots all over your car. It's okay. They're, they're staying close by, they're staying close by the hive and um, they're, they're still alive. So dead bees out in front means the hive is still alive. If, I know that doesn't make too, too much sense, but it's the truth. Uh, and also, the frost can push your hive stand around, so just make sure that your hives um, are tilted just a little bit to the front to make sure that any condensation or, or any um, rain or anything that can get inside that hive, kind of like splash up and into the hive from the bottom board can drain out again. Uh, we've we've had a hive. We had a hive once that was actually tipped back by the frost, um, and we didn't find it, you know, for a couple of weeks. But um, it just kind of there. Yeah, there was a puddle in the back of the hive, so something to watch out for. Um, okay, and this is a good tip um, to weigh your hives. Um, we don't have any scales underneath our hives. This is one of our hives that we were looking at today. And we've actually, I, it, was, it was a feat for me to lift it up with four fingers. Um, they say if you get down to three fingers, if you can lift your hive with three fingers, I guess kind of depending on who you are, I guess that makes a difference. But if you can lift your hive with two, three fingers, um, you really want to keep an eye on that um, because your your hive is getting a little bit lighter and lighter. Um, and just know that if you get to two, it's you're in an emergency feed situation and you want to get your um, your fondant on those hives. Obviously, it's early in the year, so I would expect everybody's hives to be four fingers um, heavy. Uh, another thing is, you can't really see it too well here, but we've got a mouse guard on right now. Um, and see this little guy coming in with some pollen. Um, but that is mostly it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Amy. Yeah. Uh, did I hear you correctly when you said you double nukes, you brought them up to 45 pounds? Yep. Um, yeah, we've, so, so it's five over five, five deeps over five deeps.
I'm not sure if Ed's still there, but um, you know, since we have Ed on on the call or uh, meeting, I don't know that this is considered a call. Um, Ed, can you speak to the overwintering of a top bar? We might have lost him. That's an awesome picture, Amy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Taken today. I, we might have lost Ed. Um, Amy, I have a question. Sure. When you said that you feed the honey back, um, when you put that in a bucket, are you putting that like in like a quill feeder or something and putting it inside the hive? We actually use uh, mason jars. And you know what, I, I meant to include that information in my presentation, so I'm glad you brought it up. We use the inverted mason jar method. Um, so what we would do is just put that honey in a mason jar and fill it nearly to the top. We would actually add a little bit of water to make it um, able to pass through, but you wanna poke some holes in that mason jar lid. And when you, and they actually should be fairly large holes, um, bigger than one to one that you would that you would use in the in the spring if you had a package. But you want to invert it and kind of give it a little bit of a shake, and make sure that the honey or the two to one is actually coming out a little bit. Um, and if it's not, then you know, in, increase the size of those holes just a little bit more. Amy, can I add something to that? Sure. Um, so actually, Paul helped me with this. So some of my bees actually like closed the holes up with propolis. Oh, so, yeah. so as the season kind of progresses, something I found that's really helpful is just making sure that they remain patent. Like that might not be the right word, um, but like, you know, you don't want it to be your holes to be closed up by propolis. So you, it, it's just, it's a quick check when you're refilling those mason jars. But um, that is also my preferred like feeding method and I, I find that the the bees do really well with that and I don't get a lot of like rodents and stuff um not rodents rodents but like bugs um messing with it um and and, and I don't know but um but anyway that's a good tip that Paul actually helped me with uh, hi Amy my computer quit hi hi Ed <laughs> Had to run and grab another one. Oh boy. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I heard you start your, your answer, but I asked you on the 45 pound double new. Yep, yep. Uh, so we run um, deeps. So it'll be five over five and they're deeps. And we do get it up to about 45 pounds. So you, you have 10 frames, correct? Yes. Or eight, 10 yeah. or eight. So are you, okay. All right, maybe I'm uh, I'm thinking of the other type of double nuke where you have uh, uh, four on four on each side, side by side. No, yeah, no, sorry. Okay, these these are a regular five frame nuke, and you have a second story on it. That's right. Okay, because I, I oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm, no, no, please continue, Ed. I'm sorry. I use um I run a lot of single stage, um, ten frame deeps, single brood box. Yep. And I get those up to around 70. So the 45 just um, struck me as that I heard it wrong. Did, did you have any problems getting them through the winter? Do you got to feed them around January 1st or anything like that? No, no, we haven't had to feed them. I think oh. probably because the colony is pretty small to begin with. Okay, my, my colonies are huge. Usually when I, because I take, well, I drag them back down into one stage. So they're, uh, they're, I guess, bigger. That's okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably. Good. That's do good. You, do you think that's what determines whether you do a, a one deep, like 10 frame or a five deep double nuke? Like, is that what determines it? Is, is it colony size? That's just interesting. 
everything like because I've always like decreased to one deep but I never thought to like that there might be a benefit to doing a dual deep like nuke instead I, I I've never done a uh, a two-story five frame nuke so I, I'm I Amy, do you have, do you think that that's, um, do you think it's colony size or is that just like a personal preference or have you had more success with doing that over a one deep 10 frame? Well, one of the reasons that we do it is because we want to keep it as a nuke. We don't want it to be a full hive. So okay. when it goes into the winter, the brood nest is at the bottom and there's honey above. And as the season moves on and in the spring, the bees are at the top and the brood nest is at the top and we can just completely remove that bottom box and we still have a nuke. We don't have a spread out full on hive that needs to, you know, needs to be a full on hive. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. So they, do they fill both, um, both stages? Or are you saying they're quite small and they only fit in one to begin with? Well, they, they pretty much are in one to begin with. And then we add, okay. when we when we start to get a fall flow, we'll add a second. Um, and it, they don't usually go crazy with the brood. Um, sometimes we have to feed them a little bit because we're starting them kind of late. And it is, you know, they are deeps so that they have to fill up. Um, so we might feed some honey back to them or some two to one, depending on what we have on hand. Okay. Yeah, they all they all started off as queen rearing nukes. Okay, that's that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Maybe I'll uh, try like something like that next year. Mm-hmm. Nikki, now that we have Ed back, do you want to have him? Yeah. Um, so I was just going to ask Ed. Um, do you have any comments in regards to overwintering a top bar hive? I think I know the answer, but I would like to hear it from you. <laughs> overwintering. Um, with the exception of uh, side bottom insulation, I, I actually just treat them identical to a, a line straw. Um, you, you feed them at the same time and treat them at the same time and, and, um, you know, and, and reduce the uh, reduce the bars down. So anything that's empty um, before you, you kind of walk away for the winter type deal is um, is to pull them aside and put them on the other side of the flower board so they can't get to them. Um, if you have an end hive, uh, 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 excuse me, a, a top out with a opening at the end, you should put the um, brood in front and the, uh, the honey in the back, the furthest away from the opening. If you have a, a middle one, you should uh, put it all on one side. Just pick one side or the other, it doesn't matter, because they're gonna have the brood in the middle and they're gonna have honey on both sides. So keep the brood in the middle and they take the honey from one side and put it on the other, behind the honey that's already there. But I do not, um, as far as insulation goes, I have still yet to insulate a hive in any way, shape, or form. I know people are cringing out there right now when I say that, but... Um, hey, uh, you've done it for a long time. I mean, those are words of wisdom. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna take it as that. But, um, but like, when you put the bar to, like, quote-unquote, end the hive, mm -hmm. you don't have to insulate, like, from that bar all the way to the end of the hive. No. Like the physical, the physical wood structure. I mean, I, I know what you say. Yeah, you're just yeah. gonna have a big giant opening there. Right. Um, sure. No, I treat it just like a, a, a storage, a storage space. Um, I, I throw the feeders in there. I throw the extra power boards. I throw empty comb, drawn comb, foundation, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, empty bars, the whole bit. I just throw it over there and hope the mice don't attack. Um, there's no way for them to get to it unless they chew through something because there is no openings down there. If there is, they're always plugged up with a cork. And they do eat through corks. Um, I didn't think they could, or they would, but they do. So I've gone to um, dowels 
buy a dowel, cut a little nickel out of it, and pop it in the hole. Nice. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to kind of uh, like right, go to the, ch the chat. Excuse? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, uh, this is Mike. Hi, Amy. Hey, um, Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, I, I just have a question in terms of the timing. You, you know, when you, um, uh, you were talking about the feeding and also your uh, insulation on top. Do you generally have a, a set date that you're doing it, or you do it by the weather, or what? What does it usually look like for you? Well, I usually we just kind of usually look at the weather like i said if we're gonna feed two to one we tried to to finish that up early last week because we saw that it was going to be pretty pretty cold um this coming week um and as far as insulation what we really actually only do is we just add the winter covers um and because you know heat rises and and that's really Really, what we do, we haven't um, wrapped the tar. We haven't wrapped anything in tar paper yet. We probably wouldn't do that until probably December at this point. Um, oh, oh, so your insulation's on already? Yeah. Yep. Okay. But I think it's probably too early to, for people to be putting bee cozies on. I'm just talking about, um, you know, our top insulation. The, yeah, the, yeah. the winter covers are insulated. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I wanted to kind of touch touch base on some of the chat that was going. So um, Lori has a question that says, when you say the hive should weigh 90 pounds, do you mean the whole hive? How many boxes? So we run um, 10 frame boxes and it'd be two brew boxes. So, uh, you know, 20 deeps. Um, and that, that's about how much the entire hive will weigh. And then Glenna says, um, do you put the jars right over the frames or above the inner cover? We put our jars above the inner cover. We'll actually put like some real small, um, we call them rails. They're just shims and we put them side by side um, close to the opening in the inner cover, you know, those holes at the top. Um, and we'll, we'll put the jars on them and they'll kind of like be straddles so that the bees can get underneath them. Um, they actually have to crawl out of the inner cover in order to get to it. So we don't put the jars directly on the holes of the inner cover. If that you know what? Makes so sense. Amy, you know what I use? I use mm -hmm. paint stirrers. Yes. So every time I go to like Home Depot, I just grab a couple paint stirrers. People are pretty nice and they'll just be like, yeah, how many do you need? And I'll say, I don't know, six, 10, whatever, whatever you can give me. And those work great for, if, for that. If it's yeah. the perfect size. Yeah. And I just like break them in half with my hands and, and there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Oh, come on, guys. So, Amy, I've got to tell you that I received um, a real lot of great feedback. There's, there's a lot on the group chat. I think that people really enjoyed this talk, and I'm so glad. Um, and um, I even got text messages saying that this was a great talk. So I think that it was recorded, and Steve can kind of chime in on that. But anybody who missed it will be able to. And um, I mean, if you guys don't have any more questions, I'm happy to kind of call it on, on tonight.